Welcome to the Zealous Podcast. I'm your host, Rocky Snyder. This week, I've got Kevin Carr in the house. He is a co-founder of the Certified Functional Strength Coach Certification out by Mike Boyle and his crew. Kevin's a big part of it, as well as a whole bunch of other things, including perform better and more. We're going to have a conversation with him. But before we get started, Satanta College. Remember, you can get a Master's of Science in Performance Coaching, or you can get a Master's of Science in Sports Injury and Return to Performance Management. They've got programs for applied sports biomechanics and movement science as well as applied sport and exercise psychology. Just go to tatscollege.com, add the, the code RS10 for 10% off your tuition. And if you want more education, well, just go to rockysnyder.com. Continuing education workshops are online as well as in person for your entire training and medical staff. So that means CEUs for your athletic trainers, your physical therapists, your chiropractors, personal trainers, and strength coach. Just go to rockysnyder.com, give us a ring, and, and we'll be happy to help you. In the meantime, follow us on Instagram at Rocky underscore Snyder and subscribe to this podcast. Let's go. Well, Kevin, thanks for joining me on Zealous. Uh, I've been looking forward to this. You're you're basically in my my old neck of the woods where I grew up in Middlesex County, Massachusetts. And not only that, speaking of Massachusetts, we're both fellow alum of UMass Amherst. And yeah. so I, I I think I got there about a decade or more when <laughs> before you arrived on campus, but we won't we won't delve too deep into the years. But uh you went through you got your bachelor's at UMass, is that correct? Correct. Yeah, two proud Minutemen here. Yep. Yeah, I uh, graduated in two thousand ten. Uh, nice. from UMass Amherst. Uh, I got to tell you, I went by campus about a year ago, just drove through, and it's a little different from 1990 when I left there. You know, you've done a are. lot of building, and, huh? Oh my gosh, dude, I didn't recognize the campus. I mean, I, I could tell where the pond was. I could still see that as I was yeah. driving by, but all the buildings surrounding it, there were several that I didn't recognize. So it's come a long way, and, and so has the exercise science department. At UMass, it was, I won't say it was quite as credible as it is now. So you, you went to UMass, what, what happened after that? Take me through a little bit of a timeline up till yeah. now, what you've been doing. Well, I was lucky. So I graduated in 2010, but I started interning with Mike Boyle at uh, MBSC in 2008. So I was in my undergrad when I started my internship experience and getting practical hands-on experience there. Um, which was nice because, you know, I would go back over summer break or spring break or winter break and work some hours. So I was kind of getting my hands-on experience while I was in my undergrad. So then when I graduated in 2010, I went straight into working at MBSC, like right the week after I got out, I was there coaching. And so I was able wow. to kind of transition into being there full time right away because I already kind of had, you know, two years or so underneath my belt with them um, and kind of jumpstart right into my career. I knew uh, that's exactly what I wanted to do. After my internship experience, I I was very clear on that that I wanted to coach, and, and go right into that environment at MBSC as a coach. So I, I was very fortunate. I got a jump start kind of on my practical experience early in my college career, so that I could kind of get right into it. Right on. Now, yeah. were you a a client of Mike's for a little while, or how did you come upon no, it? No, actually, this is a great story. So um, I grew up not that far. You know, you know Massachusetts and MBSC's Woburn. Um, I grew up in Maynard, Massachusetts, Central Mass, so probably about 35, 40 minutes away. I had no idea uh, MBSC even existed. I was, you know, you know, I, I grew up, I was going to Gold's Gym in high school. I had a, I loved lifting. And I always tell the story. Um, there was a guy working at Gold's. I just worked the front desk mainly so I could have a membership to work out for free. Um, and there was a guy who was a private contractor there. And I just, I took my ACE personal training certification. Um, the second I turned 18, right, I knew nothing about training whatsoever. I just kind of did the machine circuit uh, that was yeah. in Gold's. But there was this guy who was a private contractor. His name was Clark Evans. And I look over and he he's, you know, training clients. He's doing single leg deadlifts. He's doing single leg squats. He's doing hang cleans. He's doing chin-ups. All stuff that I didn't do or really know much about. And I was talking to him. And he's like, oh, yeah, you, you come work out with me. I worked out with him. It crushed me. And he was like, I just did this mentorship with this guy, Mike Boyle. He's a strength coach at Boston University. And he, that was when we were doing those week-long mentorships where you'd spend a week at MBSC, you'd go to BU with Mike. And, um, you know, he was like, you should really look into it. If you're going to go to school for exercise science or kinesiology, you should look into an internship. So I just, you know, threw my hat in the ring. After my freshman year, I applied and I got an internship there. 
over the summer and, and the rest is history. So I always credit Clark for pointing me in the right direction early on. Cause I, I had no idea who Mike was. I kind of didn't really have any idea about strength and conditioning as a whole. So he really turned me on to the right things to read the places to go. So um, I was very fortunate um, that I kind of stumbled into to this experience the way that I did. Right on. And so yeah. you, right out of college, it, you go from Amherst to the eastern part of the state, you start working mm -hmm. for Mike, but uh, you're not satisfied with that because these days you, you've moved up the ladder. You're doing a lot of things on your own, but you've really contributed heavily to the functional strength coach and, and so on. So kind of Bring me up to speed through the, the moment you walked in the door and, yeah. and where you are. Yeah, so I was working there as a coach, and I was toying with the idea of going back to school for physical therapy. I, we had a need for some more hands-on manual therapy kind of at the gym. John Paloff, many people are familiar with the Paloff Press. His office is there. He's had a PT clinic with us since the day I started there. Um, but I kind of toyed with the idea of going for PT school, and I actually went back for massage therapy. Um, and so around 2013 – I graduated with a massage therapy degree. I was taking classes at night and on weekends while I was coaching. And I started, you know, movement as medicine, massage therapy. So next door to uh, the gym, I have a massage therapy clinic with a few therapists in there where we kind of work in conjunction with physical therapists like John as well and, and provide manual therapy, therapeutic exercise to help people with chronic pain and stiffness kind of transition back to training or whatever athletic endeavors they have. And so I also run that business concurrently i started that about 10 years ago um so i work as a therapist i work as a coach and then around that same time we launched the certified functional strength coach certification course and you know there was always kind of i mentioned those mentorships people asking us to put together a certification model um like a course that people could go through to understand our training philosophy to prepare their coaches um to do their job you know, well, lots of times people would send their coaches to us for education, but we didn't really have a formal model that we put people through outside of what we did for our internship for staff training um, to kind of get our staff up to speed. And so what Brendan, Rerick, Kevin Larrabee, myself and Mike kind of put together was a formal curriculum that we could, you know, bring people through both, both with an online piece and then most importantly, an in-person practical where people would come and actually spend the day coaching hands on going through our entire kind of coaching system and then kind of most importantly, going through a practical examination where they have to show mastery of, you know, program design and coaching and progressions and regressions, because we kind of saw that that was kind of missing. I felt like in our field is most kids come out of an exercise science program like my, myself who don't have any practical experience whatsoever. I remember teaching, you know, a weight training class my senior year, I taught the lab and Oh, all these exercise science students, a lot of these kids never really lifted weights, but they were going to school to be a physical therapist, to go through exercise science program, and they didn't have much weight training experience themselves. And so we wanted to put together an education model where, you know, we, you know, you have to be able to demonstrate, you have to be able to look at something, have a coach's eye and say, hey, we're going to make an adjustment here. And that's really what we teach in CFSC. And that's been 10 years now, about 15,000 coaches later, you know, travel all over the world, um, you know, providing education almost weekly uh, through certification courses um, in our system. Fantastic. You know, yeah. it, it's, it's interesting too. Uh, we have shared paths in some ways. You mentioned you're doing a lot of selectorized equipment and through the nineties and early two thousands, that yeah. was, you know, big, we won't mention the, the, the manufacturers, the brand names, but they, they're still littered throughout most, gyms because of the ease with which you can do them but at the same time we bring up that word functional and and they're lower level if we want to consider that everything has a function but mm -hmm. uh, we don't move in in isolated manners of course these days it's a, a lot more closed chain motions and so on you guys uh, like the programs that we do are either heavily based on unilateral or contralateral motion. We aren't trees that are rooted into the ground. So the, the bilateral stuff has its place, just like the equip the machines have their place. But I guess long-winded thing here is how was it for you to unlearn and to relearn when it comes to that, that functional approach? Yeah. I mean, I would say I, I was lucky in that I hadn't learned that much yet. <laughs> before I got to Mike, like I, I, it is true that like we have a lot of interns or people who come to work for us who, you know, have an extensive background 
in a different approach to training and right, we're kind of working our way through that. I was fortunate in that, like I hadn't done that much before I got to MBSC. So I, I realized really quickly, like, Oh, this seems like the right way to do things. Um, but it, it, it was uh, eye opening to me to begin with. Like when I first went into MBSC, I had never seen training programs built the way they were, where we, you know, we foam rolled, we stretched, we warmed up, we did, you know, power and athletic movements. Then we went and we Olympic lifted and then we lifted and then we conditioned. Like it was a full program that I'd never seen before. And to me, it was a big eye opener. Um, but I saw athletes being successful. I saw general population people feeling better and saying, hey, you know, I'm able to go back and play tennis or I'm able to go you know, run a few times a week. Now I wasn't able to do that before. And I saw it working <laughs> right away. So to me, I thought like, wow, this is this amazing thing that at that time, I'm like, I don't think anybody knows about this. Right. And it's grown. Um, but then that's why I'm so passionate about it because I feel like we have this um, great system or this great approach to training that a lot of us use that, that can be so helpful to people um, because it's thoughtful in our exercise selection. I always say functional training is like a buzzword. I wrote a book called functional training anatomy. And what I said is like, people hear the word functional training and like, I guess the common thing people first vision in their head is someone standing on like a balance ball and like swinging something around. But to me, functional means purposeful, meaning we're taking the time to select exercises based on the structure and the function of the human body and trying to pick the best tool for the job. And the best tool is going to depend on, you know, the people you're working with. And there's going to be a lot of general overlap there. But um, what I, this is the first time I saw people really be thoughtful about exercise selection to try to improve someone's end goal. And so, um, that's really what we try to teach and share as much as possible. So just to qualify, I guess, to the listening audience, it's not just general population. We're talking about MBSC and Woburn Mass. I mean, Mike used to be part of the Bruins organization as well as BU, but you guys have a lot of professional athletes coming in, not only from the New England region, but from all over. And you've you've trained high caliber athletes, not just general population. So mm -hmm. just to put that out there, because this podcast is primarily the pros behind professional sports, which you guys are. But mm -hmm. with that said, and we're talking about function, the, the level of function, and I, I've discussed this before in previous conversations and podcasts and so on, that the advance of technology takes away from purposeful physical activity and you're mentioning function as purposeful movement if the average american each year is reduced in regards to the frequency with which they purposefully move then each year you're going to see an increased degradation in structural integrity alignment functionality and i i say this because it's not that we have to create programs where we're dumbing things down. I don't think I really use that phrase, but you're having to meet those individuals wherever they are. And, and therefore, I am imagining that over the course of the last 10 to 15 years, your programs have had to change to accommodate that. Is that accurate? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And I think, I think to a credit that you know, our general population training has gotten more and more popular because there's an increased demand because people don't necessarily feel and move great. I mean, we're in a world where there's this amazing technological innovation of convenience for people where like I could live my life sitting at this desk. I could get food delivered to me. I could, if I need a ride somewhere, I could go on my phone. I could walk out my front door, get in the car. I could never leave my house if I, if I really wanted to. But there's, there's downstream effects for that for the everyday person that are taking away, you know, the daily physical activity that they have. So we are, we are, there's a demand to replace it, um, hopefully, for people in formalized training, right. And so when now, in our general population training for the everyday person, like you mentioned, like, yeah, we have to provide them uh, getting them getting them to move their joints through a full range of motion every day, shoulders, hips, back, spine, neck, um, ankles and then general movement skills that maybe they would have gotten if they were you know physically active on a daily basis then moving to things like power then moving to things like strength training and then cardiovascular and aerobic work and so yes there's i mean we we have to be able to see the people that come in to work with us figure out where they're at and then build a program that meets them where they are i think that if you're going to say what do trainers do what is our primary purpose is to 
um, bring the training program to the person, right? They're coming to us because they're not sure where to start. And so great coaches generally are able to say, hey, this is where your starting point is, um, and then build a program around them and slowly bring them along uh, to, to where they need to be. And that's really what we do on a daily basis, whether it's a competitive athlete at a high level or whether it's you know, an everyday person who's you know, just looking to get back into to exercise. Well, let's take that competitive athlete for a second and, and talk about it in the same regard. Uh, the, the, uh, the level of structural integrity, uh, of efficient joint mechanics, if you will, proper biomechanics, it, the same thing is happening to each generation of athletic professionals too, wouldn't you say? I mean, I, yeah. so do you take the same methodology? Do you take the same approach? Uh, or is it different when it comes to training the athletes first general population? Yeah. I mean, philosophically, the big picture is very similar. I would say if you take a, one of our gen pop programs, take one of our athlete programs to the lay person, you're going to say it doesn't look that different. Right. But you realize most of these athletes come in, they come in with high levels of power output and high levels of you know energy production. They're usually very fit, but we're dealing with other structural adaptations, right? I had some, a girl today, a high level softball player come in to me. Um, and you realize this girl takes thousands and thousands of swings per week. And, you know, there's a, a compensation that occurs there. One that probably makes her better at hitting a, a softball, but she came to me with back pain um, because of the, the compensatory things that she brought from hitting and hitting and hitting. This is tournament season for, uh, softball kids. Um, and so, you know, we worked on, you know, getting her pelvis moving, getting her back moving. So you, you're just, you're taking the same approach. You might just be meeting them somewhere else on the spectrum or taking into account what it is that they do, uh, from a habitual level. But, um, our overall program structure looks very similar. We just might be using slightly different methods or tools to kind of bring them along to, to where we need them to go. So if you were to pull out your crystal ball and and uh, prophesize forecast uh, 10 years down the road, what would that look like to the, the profile characteristics of high-level competitive athletes in this regard? And what I mean by that is, is that uh, this upcoming generation has been brought up with a screen in front of their face at the earliest age possible. And so with that screen time, there is a a, re, a reduction in playground activity yes. and and not to get too deep into the public school systems but physical education is at an all-time low and so yeah and to, to kind of coin mike's phrase i think he puts it well the orthopedic cost is it, it, i i see it being relatively high even though we're seeing athletic pursuits breaking records uh and and probably we'll see that at the summer Olympics here, there's going to be new records broken, but they're going to be doing that with a chassis that may not be as structurally integrated as their predecessors with uh, Olympics before it or, or, or years of professional sports before it. You know where I'm getting at? It's mm -hmm. like, how is this a concern for you? And if so, how are you addressing it? If yeah, you are. The, the younger generation of athletes, um, what we're seeing is, I mean, you're seeing the specialized athlete begin at 10 years old. Right. When you or I were kids, I always say to people now, like, I'm not that old. Every kid I know who was a great athlete was a three sport athlete um, all the way up through high school. Right. The best kids I know, the kids who were uh, who played, went on to play in college, you know, they played football, they played basketball, they played baseball. Uh, that doesn't exist anymore in, in high school or youth athletics. And it's because one, like you said, the playground and physical education has disappeared at the lower levels. And the organized sports movement for youth sports has uh, turned into a big business where kids are pressured and forced to specialize at like the age of 10 into becoming a soccer player, becoming a basketball player, becoming a hockey player. And they're not developing really general physical athletic qualities. They're generating skills specific to their sport and they're getting higher and higher levels of repetition in whatever their pattern is as opposed to, you know, playing soccer and then taking a break and playing basketball and then going and playing baseball or whatever it might be. Um, they're not getting that kind of seasonal approach to how they develop as athletes. And there's a, there is a price to pay for that. I think you see kids drop out earlier. You see kids with repetitive stress injuries or injuries that you don't necessarily see 
at a young age. I mean, we know the ACL epidemic, especially with women, um, is growing and growing there. It's not slowed down whatsoever. Um, and they wonder why, but you have these kids playing more uh, matches in a year uh, than professional athletes at the age of 12. And, you, and they, you, they scratch their heads and say, well, why are we seeing so many ACL tears? Um, and so you're seeing those downstream effects now um, and these kids aren't doing anything outside of the sport. You said like they're, if they're not playing and practicing, they're on the phone. And so um, we, we, there's a price to pay for that. And then we get the survivorship bias where, you know, you see the people who set the records at the Olympics and you get their backstory and, you know, they played soccer since they were phenom since they were eight. That doesn't mean that works for everybody. And usually that's kind of a survivorship bias. And so I think the more I talk to parents in athletics um, at a young age, I tell them like, keep your kid as an athlete, as long as possible, a multi-sport athlete, as long as they can expose them to as much general physical activity as possible at a young age. And there will come a time for them to specialize maybe into high school, especially if they show a, uh, a preference or that they excel at a specific sport, but we don't want to rush them into that. And we have to maybe kind of, you know, not succumb to the pressure of the youth sports organizations who are always trying to get you to sign up for the next tournament, sign up for the other club team and, and continue to pile on those repetitions in one specific sport. And how much pushback do you get from the parents when you have this conversation? Or is it falling on deaf ears? Are they saying, oh, man, I'm so glad you say that? What's the response? Yeah, it's tough. I mean, I, I, I mean, and I, my kids, my daughter's only two. So, like, I, I'll become a sport parent at some point. Um, and it's probably easy for me to say that as some kid who's not competing because they always feel this pressure that they need to keep up with the Joneses. And, like, you know, like, you know, their kid's doing this, their kid's doing that. Um, it, I understand that. And it usually takes – an injury or a setback for them to open up their mind to, um, you know, Hey, maybe there's another way to go about this. And so, yeah, sometimes they say, Hey, well, they really need to do this tournament. And they re I'm like, does it really make a difference? Like I had a conversation with a baseball parent, um, this kid, you know, he's having shoulder and elbow issues and he played fall ball. He played spring ball. And he's like, well, we really got to do summer. I said, why? He's already in college. Like, he's not, he's not, we already know he's not going to major league baseball. So just let him lift weights for the summer, right? And he's like, wow, his coach really wants him. I said, do you care more about the coach or do you care more about the kid? And sometimes you have to tell, be direct with them to, to let them know, like, it, it, you know, you're, we're not, you know, changing the world by pitching a few innings over the summer. But if you can let the kid rest and let him train a little bit, maybe when it actually matters uh, with his college team, that, you know, things will be better. And so you, you have to be able to communicate directly and just, you know, tell them that, hey, this is for the the best interest of the, the child or the athlete that's competing um, and hopefully get the message across. But you're always going to get some pushback generally when they're playing a comparative game with the, the other kids around them. Okay. You mentioned you went and pursued manual therapy, massage therapy, and so on. Is that something that you've integrated in with the program design or are you just taking the concepts and saying, okay, here, here are the target zones that I would normally get my hands on you on a mm -hmm. table with, but I'm going to have you use these orbs or rollers or sticks or massage guns or, or whatever tools you have at your disposal. How do you, how do you integrate the, the, the manual soft mm -hmm. tissue work into a program? Typically I'm seeing the clients in a separate session, you know, one or multiple times a week, depending on what they're dealing with or, or what they're currently training their looks, their training looks like. So, you know, maybe if I, like right now, we have a lot of professional hockey players uh, in their off season training with us. They're in four days a week lifting. Typically I'm seeing them one or two days a week, um, you know, working on their hips, work on their shoulder, whatever it is that they need. And then communicating with whoever their coach is saying, Hey, like, this is what I'm seeing in the treatment room. Let's just go make some adjustments out on the floor as far as some specialty exercises, things that we want to do to kind of address whatever it is they're dealing with. Um, and so they'll see me for a short session. They go out and train either before or after. And then we kind of collaborate with the coaches. Generally, that's how it works is uh, I'll see them separately. Um, but I will say, you know, having the skills and vision as a manual therapist has certainly helped me in my daily practice as a coach. Um, from an anatomical or functional perspective, being able to look at, you know, what it is that they're dealing with, being a little bit more thoughtful in my exercise selection. The manual therapy background has certainly helped me there. Um, but I'm typically integrating it into a different session and then providing exercise in the training environment uh, to go along with that. 
So in, in that individual setting, is it something where you're giving them a movement, you're seeing, we'll just say joint mechanics, uh, one mm -hmm. area going a little bit faster than another, or for that matter, we'll just take the flip opposite and one area not moving to the speed with which it should. You're like, okay, hold on a second. Let's get you on the table. I want to mm -hmm. just kind of work on this area and then let's go back in there and see if it, if that's create a change like do you flow back and forth between table and floor and so on all the time yeah like i always tell time. people if you're coming to see me it's not a traditional massage experience right and so i was very fortunate um i've gone through all the uh sfma education um with the the people at functional movement systems and i really use that as my assessment tool and so you know for instance if i have an athlete come in you know with back pain i'm going to put them through an SFMA screen and they've done a really good job building a system to kind of take you towards, Hey, what's our end solution? Is it, you know, stability and motor control outcome? Is it a mobility outcome that it's really a great decision-making matrix. And so I use that system. Typically um, I'll find areas where there's manual therapy indications. We'll work on those things on the table and then go back out um, onto the floor and work through um, whatever's indicated from a training standpoint, whether it's mobility drills, whether it's uh, stability and, and strength based work um, and, and kind of use that as a test before and after and see kind of how we're doing. And, and we're, we have very great setup in that, like, I have my treatment rooms, I can go right on the floor um, and get them moving and be able to see kind of, hey, how did my work affect that? How do they feel subjectively? Um, and then continue to kind of build off of that. I see that as being one of the most successful ways of, of athlete training conditioning across the entire spectrum. I mean, of course, most people, and I think some that are listening to this right now are going to say, oh, yeah, that's great for like rehab, post rehab. But then after that, as if there's this this barrier that you have to cross over and suddenly you don't need that anymore and you can just train, train, train. But I, I see it going all the way from one end of the spectrum to the other that there's always going to be. Uh, fatigue at certain areas the the body is a, a a plastic entity that is always in a state of flux depending upon what it encountered in the last week or last day or last hour so there's this constant kind of i won't say manipulation but this dance that you have mm -hmm. with your your clients and athletes that you're constantly going oh okay we're, we're we've got to go where the body is telling us to go because that's really what you're using, you're using the body as a, a communication tool to know what they need in that specific moment. Is that a good way of saying it? Yeah. I mean, high level athletes are always kind of balancing on the homeostasis line. They're pushing themselves. Right. And so I always find like the higher level athletes have a real fine kind of buffer zone when they're pushing themselves to feel good and perform their best. Right. Like as we get to the end of July, we have all these professional hockey players who are not only training with us four days a week, but they're out there skating doing skill work, hard power skating. So they, I mean, they might be relatively healthy, but they don't always feel great, right? And so for us as therapists, like I'm constantly helping them continue to practice and perform at their best as they get ready for training camp in the fall. And so we're always kind of tinkering to make sure, hey, we, you're right where you need to be. They come in, their hips a little sore, their backs a little sore, their shoulders a little sore. What do we need to do? based on how you move, how you feel, what we see on the training floor to kind of keep you where we want you to be. Um, and that's really what's required if you're going to be performing at that level um, is constantly having, you know, people fine tune things to, to keep you kind of at your best or feeling your best, um, you know, so you can do what you need to do. Totally get it. Uh, we're on similar paths in that way. And, and the same thing with our approach. Uh, and, and of course, there's nuances that may be different from from between East Coast to West Coast here, where my studio is and yours and, and so on. But uh, it's it's encouraging and refreshing to know that we're, there's others taking these type of things into consideration. You mentioned FMS and the SFMA, I, and I imagine throughout your, your travels of, of education that you've gleaned other philosophies, methodologies, and so on. What other avenues of of influence, shall I say, have, do you bring into, to your day to day? Yeah. Um, I went through, uh, the postural restoration Institute pretty much all the way through a number of their courses and just the general philosophy of the, uh, using respiration as a tool, using breathing as a tool, 
um, to influence position, to influence posture, and being able to put that into whether it's your mobility work, whether it's some of your prep work, whether it's your core training has been definitely influential on our program at MBSC has been influenced on my practice at Movement as Medicine. Um, because you think the majority of our athletes don't think about how they breathe. Many of them are really extension biased. And, you know, if we can get them to understand how to inhale, exhale, create abdominal tension, we can have a pretty large influence on how their joints move, how they feel. Um, and so that's definitely been something that that's been tied in from a therapy standpoint, for sure. Um, I've gone through a number of, you know, manual therapy courses, um, you know, you know, that, both both from my massage school background and following that have kind of influenced my my hands-on practice as well and so I think the key for you know any practitioner whether you're in therapy or training is you know taking a little bit from every single thing that you learn and figuring out how to integrate it into what you know and what you do in a way that works best I would say you never go to like a course um and to think like hey I'm going to take everything and I'm going to throw everything out the window when I go back on Monday but you think, okay, how can I take those ideas and make the program I know and love a little bit better? Um, and how can we continue to adjust um, to, to try to, you know, we're never going to find the perfect program, but get as close to that as we can. And, and that's kind of, that's something I've taken from Mike in that he's always willing to, you know, open up another book or listen to another speaker and then bring it back to our staff and say, hey, what can we do better uh, in our training practice? I know a few years ago, he brought Tony Holler in, a uh, sprint coach. Um, and he, I, he, Tony Holler came in. He's a very successful high school track and field coach. He's some of the fastest high school level sprinters um, in the United States. And him talking about time sprinting um, and him being like, we don't lift weights. I don't believe in lifting weights. And I remember looking around at our staff being like, why'd Mike bring this guy? Uh, but the big message from him was that we should be taking what he calls like the feed the cat approach, feed the cats approach where it's like, Hey, we need to be do, you know, slow volume, max velocity sprinting every week if we want to get faster. And that's a, been a huge influence on our program. I mean, if you're coming, you're training with us, you're going to be running splits through the timers, pretty much everybody that sees us. And so, you know, continuing looking for other experts who we think are doing a good job and, and being like, how can we integrate some of the things they're doing into our program? And I think that's what's made us successful is our willingness to learn and continue to make adaptations as we go. And so where are your eyes being directed currently? Are there any avenues, whether conventional or non-conventional, that you're like, ah, yeah, this really piques my interest. I, I, I don't know if we want to bring this in, but I definitely i am curious about it. Yeah, I mean, I'm always looking for something right you're always looking in the margins to think like hey where am i missing something and and right now i mean kind of coming into this last summer the big thing we really looked at was um how can we do a better job integrating things like isometrics uh, or different contraction types into the training um from a health an athlete health standpoint from things like patellar tendonitis achilles tendonitis those things that tend to creep up on your athletes as the seasons go by um and i that's something that we've really been focused on this summer um, so, you know, starting with something like an isometric phase early on to build tendon strength, um, um, from a preventative standpoint for many of our athletes, both in their lower leg as well as in their knees, um, and starting to progress towards things that are more eccentric focused from there as well. And so that's really been what we focused on. And again, it's always an experiment, right? We first, we experiment with ourselves and then we experiment with our staff. And then once we feel like we have a good grip, we'll start to put it into the program. And that's kind of what we're working through now. And it's, it's been pretty good and the athletes seem to enjoy it. So we'll kind of know at the end of summer, we tend to do a uh, post-mortem on the summer program and say like, Hey, how do we think this went from both a training effect standpoint, as well as a practical application on the floor standpoint. And then we, we go back to the drawing board in the fall for the next program and, and keep going from there. And when it comes to sports science, like velocity-based training, pressure plates, that type of thing. How much do you, do you guys utilize that? Or is that something mm -hmm. that. Uh, uh, on an just... individual level, we will, yeah. um, in a group level from, a, again, going back to the idea of practical application, it can be more challenging. So if you think about kind of the context is how we tend to work in our business is we typically have groups of eight or 10 athletes at a time. Um, and so it can be challenging to kind of um, integrate something fully like force plate usage or, uh, VBT. Um, but 
with individual clients, we have the resources. John Paloff has uh, the Hawkins plates uh, at the gym. And so typically when I have athletes who are injured in the rehab process, whether it's an ACL, some sort of lower leg injury, we'll usually do an assessment. Um, I'll work with John to do an assessment on the plates. We'll get some feedback. We'll provide exercise intervention, then come back to the plates throughout the rehab process to kind of track our progress there. We'll kind of use them in that context mostly. Yeah, there's there's two different, uh, how would I say, it, departments perhaps. There is the, the, the force production, looking at the metrics there, how well are they maintaining and where is their fatigue? But then you also have the, the movement quality and, mm -hmm. and the kinematic sequencing. How, how do you marry those two together? Yeah, and so this is something that, that I've actually talked with John Palaf a lot about is that, you know, for instance, I had an athlete um, who had an ankle fr uh, tibia fracture, um, limited ankle mobility. And like when we looked at him on the, like we look at him on the table and I see him move on the floor, I could see that his ankle doesn't move the way it needs to, right? So I know that there's a uh, mobility limitation there that's affecting how he feels upstream when he plays. Um, but then getting him on the plates, we could see very clearly when he did a bilateral jump and then unilateral on either side, his ability to absorb force and then that amortization phase to come back was severely limited on that side where he was, you know, limited in ankle dorsiflexion. And so what we did is we provided some manual therapy. We gave him some exercises that we integrated in a program for him to do regularly at home, um, monitored his progress. And then he'd come back and be like, Hey, the ankle seems like it's moving better. Let's see how that reflects, you know, when we put you back on the plates and see you jump and we see improvements, right? His, his, uh, ability to be elastic on that side had improved, um, which one translates to performance, but also translates to his injury risk. He had had following that ankle fracture, recurrent kind of sprains and irritations on that ankle that have seemed to clear up as we start to clear that ankle up. And so using data in that context from a rehab standpoint is really, really helpful. Um, as long as you're marrying it to the things that you're actually doing on the floor and, and being purposeful with the use of the data. Okay, with that said, and there's debate about this, but would you be more biased toward the side that requires a little bit more attention uh, when it comes to program volume? Or are you going to just go, okay, well, we're going to do the same thing regardless of both, both legs? Uh, not necessarily more bias and volume, um, but there was more volume as far as um, maybe specific exercises. So, like our big rock exercises, some of our plyometrics are uh major lifts didn't really change but um as far as the mobility work for that ankle we there was definitely much more volume on that affected side um as far as the specific ankle strengthening stuff that he was doing at home on his own and kind of pre-lift definitely more volume on those things um because we had a deficit there um but as far as the majority of the program i would say 90 percent of what we were doing looked pretty symmetrical from side to side outside of those those few things yeah, I could, I can imagine. I mean, especially the higher level caliber, the 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 better cheats they are, more or less, yeah. right? And, yeah. and finding ways to get around it to produce the force they need. So, and is that something you just? How long do you continue that path? How long do you assess, reassess? It's just a continual program for this individual, or when do you kind of just close the chapter on that? Yeah, I mean, once we started to see one from subjective feedback from him. Hey, how do you feel um, playing? Do you have still have soreness in that ankle following uh, the gate? Like he would come in after a couple of games and be like, I have soreness in my ankle. That was pretty good subjective feedback that we had an issue there. Um, hey, I, know I feel fine after games. We did some more assessments. Hey, we looked like we've evened you up pretty close based on the parameters to kind of John sets on the, the plates. Um, and we're continuing, we're still keeping kind of those specialty exercises in the program. I just said, Hey, just make these part of what you do. Um, because in reality, these are probably things that he should have been doing beforehand, right? Whether it's regular ankle mobility work, whether it's base, uh, lower leg calf tibia, uh, tibialis type work to keep that ankle moving. I said, those are things you're just going to keep in the program. Right. And then if we tend to see things flare up, right, maybe we can reassess. Um, but generally once he felt good, we were like, let's just kind of keep the normal training program and we'll just make sure we're staying on top of those things. And, and we've been kind of smooth sailing since then. 
Right on. Okay. Now, uh, other things we have in common, we're both presenting at Perform Better Training Summits. You're going to be in Providence next month. And what's, what's your topic that you'll be speaking on? Yeah, my topic is called uh, Five Fitness Facts That Could Save Your Life. And so what I'm going to be speaking about is kind of broadly, both from a why and how standpoint behind how we build programs for general population clientele, um, the science behind training as it affects, you know, health span and lifespan um, and longevity and resilience. Like, why do we build programs the way that we do from mobility to how do we build the movement prep to power to strength and to conditioning from a scientific standpoint? Why is it important we do these things to stave off things like chronic disease and and um, improve lifespan and health span and then really give the people who are attending in the practical an experience of going through that program. I, when I did it in Orlando earlier this summer, I really took people in that hands-on from beginning to end through an adult program and explained why do we build the program this way uh, and, and took them through that experience. And so that's what I'm going to be doing in Providence as well. And the, the training demographic, it, are we talking general population, athletes, yeah. or, or general across population. the spectrum? General pop. And mm -hmm. how does that vary from what you do with the athletes? Just a uh, lower level yeah. of intensity and volume? Yep. Similar to like what you said about meeting them where they're at. I mean, they're usually not as uh, ready for impact-based activities, right? Things like plyometrics and warm-up movement skills might be toned down um, comparatively to the, what we do with the athletes. Um, our exercise selection might be a bit more conservative, right? Well, maybe I might you know, be hang cleaning and doing things like this with the athletes. We might be doing kettlebell swings or just jump jumps and things with the uh, adult population. But then the overall meat of the weight training program looks pretty similar, right? They're going to push, they're going to pull, they're going to do knee dominant, they're going to do hip dominant, they're going to do multi-planar core work. And then our conditioning uh, might be slightly different. With athletes, we might do more running-based work than we do with the gen pop, but they're going to do some sort of um, either um, high-intensity interval-based work or some more steady-state type uh, conditioning. It might not be a sport specific, but the meat of the program is going to look in the structure is going to look pretty, pretty similar. Right on. Okay. We won't call them mistakes. We'll call them learning experiences. Yeah. G give me an idea of what, what's in the last, say 10, 15 years in your career, what's been one of the largest learning experiences you've come into play with? Um, you know what? The biggest thing that I think I've learned kind of as a coach um, is I would say my largest improvements from where I've made mistakes is I always say like the, the training stuff is easy. Like for me, learning the technical aspects in building programs, that has always been pretty straightforward to me, but the interpersonal skills um, for me were the hardest part of my job. Um, I would say like when I started at MBSC, I was not naturally extroverted. I probably didn't have the interpersonal communication skills that I've developed in my 16 years there since. And so I think what I've learned to become effective as a coach um, is learning how to listen to clients, learning how to uh, communicate effectively and meet them you know, where they're coming from. If I think back to anyone who I thought was like a problem client early in my career, it was probably more so that I didn't have the communication skills necessary to bring that pe person along effectively, uh, more so that than, than them being problematic. And so I would say many of the mistakes I made early in my career uh, were not a lack of technical skills, but more a lack of interpersonal communication skills to understand how to relate, um, whether it's an athlete dealing with an injury whether it's a gen pop client who might be fearful or have had previous negative experiences with exercise, the me developing skills to deal with those people has made me certainly more successful um, and more effective as a coach. And so one thing I always talk to our coaches about our young coaches, especially is that look at every experience you have with a client where you feel challenged whether it's like, hey, they're fearful to try this exercise or they have preconceptions about exercise that you might not agree with as a challenge for your communication skills. And when you look at it that way, um, for me, I've really developed in that regard a lot in my time that I've worked there. And I can look back at some of the mistakes I made now and think like, oh, I'm glad I learned from that. And so um, I always kind of, you know, remind our coaches that 
that's probably the number one thing I need you to work on um, to be successful as a coach because we're in a people business, right? Our job is developing relationships, whether it's with an athlete that's competitive or a general population person. It starts with relationship building. And so that's kind of, I think, the key framework that I try to think around to when uh, trying to do my job as, as well as possible. And so with that, did you gain experience just over time learning from these yeah. episodes or uh, did you pursue outside uh, opinions and knowledge? Like, is there a book on the art of coaching or interpersonal relationship that you're like, yeah. I, I picked that up and I got some really great advice from it? How to win friends and influence people. Uh, we give them, there we, we give it to Dale every Connery. single, yeah, we give it to every intern um, be, because like if you can master the things in that book uh, from a communication standpoint um, and, and understand how to relate to people, people will do anything you want, right? And to I think the key to motivating people is having a relationship with them. Um, and so that that 100%, it's a book that I refer back to all the time. It might be on the shelf back here somewhere. If not, it's upstairs um, to go back to all the time as a refresher. Well, there's another similarity. That was a book that I gave out to all my trainers at one point in time. And <laughs> I, I got to honestly admit that I haven't done that in a while, but now you're sparked my interest again. And it reminded me that that's a great resource. Uh, and you are a great resource. If people want to connect with you, ask you questions, aside from going to perform better training summit mm -hmm. in Providence uh, in, in August, how else can they connect with you? Yeah, at Movement is Medicine on Instagram uh, for training content is probably the easiest place to get me. Uh, also, strengthcoach.com. Actually, we have a forum that is built for that, um, that you could talk to me. You could talk directly to Mike. If you, I always tell people, if you want to get a hold of Mike, the quickest way to do it is to post on the forum and talk to him. And so those would probably be the two best places to contact myself, uh, especially around training-related uh, information. Uh, I appreciate your time, Kevin. This has been great. And so although I won't be in Providence, I'll look forward to the next time our, our paths cross, whether it's at Perform Better or some other organization, or maybe I'll just walk into the, your place in Woburn the next time I'm in Boston. Please do. Please do. It'd be great to see you, Rocky. I appreciate you having me on. And that's a wrap for this episode of Zealous Podcast. I want to thank Kevin for coming on and sharing all that great insight into training. You want more information, check the description below on how you can get a hold of him, LinkedIn, Instagram, and more. And remember, satantacollege.com, 10% off your tuition. They've got more programs than just masters, so check them out. But add that RS10 to your Masters of Science program, you'll get 10% off your entire tuition. And don't forget, going to Rocky Science com if you're interested in getting continuing education units for yourself or for your staff whether you're chiropractors physical therapists athletic trainers personal trainers or strength coaches we've got something for everyone remember follow us on instagram at rocky underscore snyder and if you didn't click that subscribe button here's your opportunity and while you're at it check out my book it's been out for a little while but it's still pretty valid return to center strength training to improve performance we'll see you next next week.